Okay, we're back. I figured out what was happening. Let's play some bass. Thanks for coming. Ooh. We're here. We're going to talk about some pedal stuff. I'm going to make some noises, but mostly I want to talk about some pedal stuff that actually matters to you. Let's kill this loop and talk. Thanks for coming. I'm so glad you're here. As promised, we're wearing the Star Wars Christmas sweater. <laughs> I hope you wore a dorky sweater too. Please say hi in the comments. Let me know where you're watching from. Let me look at your comments thank you purple chili love the sweater i love the sweater too i basically stole this sweater from my uncle i was at a family gathering and he was wearing it and i was like that's such an amazing sweater and it was like as though we had some cultural custom where when you compliment something they have to give it to you he just gave me the sweater and now it's mine so thanks uncle mark yes hello Dino, New Jersey. Hello, cheese pizza in Atlanta, Georgia. What is up? Michelle in Quebec. Bonjour. JG in Brazil. Woo! Arthur in Kentucky. Andrea in Columbus. I know Columbus. I played some shows in Columbus. I'm watching this in hell. That's from uh, <clears throat> Batman. Hi from Chile. What's up? What's up, people from the places? Okay, let's get rolling here. So we're going to do a lot of Q&A at the end like we did last time, but I want to start with an actual topic today, which is what pedals should you actually buy? So I'm going to talk about that, talk about some pedals that can actually improve your bass playing, which probably sounds like a hypey clickbait title, but I actually have something to say about it. Um, and I also I want to share some of my favorite music that uses bass pedals in a cool way. So that's what we're looking at today. So if you have questions, feel free to type them now, but just know that I may miss them uh, and I'll get to them at the end and you'll know when that's happening. So here's the thing. We're going to talk about what pedals improve your playing. I'm going to clap my hands together a lot of times <laughs> to be emphatic. Um, so what pedals should you actually buy is the title of this stream. And plot twist, it's an impossible question because it, it depends on a million things, you know? And I know there are videos floating out there that are like, the only five pedals you need. And, and I, I take issue. I take issue because pedals aren't about need. They're about fun most of the time, unless you have one of those rare gigs that actually needs bass pedals. Um, so what kinds of effects do you actually need? Do you need octaves? Do you need drive? Do you need delay? Do you need reverb? Blah, 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 blah. It really depends on what you're doing. Are you doing a top 40 wedding thing? Are you in like an ambient shoegaze situation? Are you in a metal band? Like totally different needs in all the situations. So since I'm a bass teacher, I thought the best way to tackle this question would be to talk about the types of pedals that you can actually use to improve your playing besides just making a bunch of cool noises. I mean, making cool noises. It's fun, like I could just make cool noises all day. Um, but I wanna talk about the other things you can do with pedals and that's why I have these three pedals sitting for us today. I did not whip out my entire arsenal. We're looking at octaves, delays, and loopers. And I'm going to explain why those three pedals specifically. Okay, so I'm just going to get right into it. Sorry, I'm missing your comments. I need four sets of, wait, four eyes, two sets of eyes would be adequate for this, but I only have one. So first, let's talk about the octave pedal. So this is maybe my favorite. If I had to pick one kind of pedal, like the only kind of effect I could ever have again, it would maybe be an analog octave pedal. So a uh, quick thing you need to know about how to use an octave pedal to make your playing better is the difference between analog and digital octaves. And I'm going to explain this in a non, uh, from the perspective of somebody who doesn't know how to build pedals, because that's like way beyond me. Thank you, Tim, for the super chat. Um, 
let me get to your question real quick before I miss it. How much private lessons do you get with the Beginner Badass course? You get none. Uh, it's all pre-recorded, and I do answer your questions, and you can hang out in the forum, ask questions there, but uh, it's not a, um, not a private lesson situation. Okay, so analog versus digital octaves. An analog octave pedal makes a very specific sound, which you'll hear right now. You can hear it sounds really synthesizery, and that's because it's actually synthesizing a note based on the no bass notes you send into it, but it's not reproducing the sound of your bass per se. Whereas a digital octave pedal is doing more clever digital algorithmy things to make it sound like your bass sounds, but just an octave lower or higher, depending. And um, the other difference between analog and digital is that analog octaves are generally, if not exclusively, monophonic, meaning they can only understand one note at a time. So if I play one note, it sounds cool. You guys hearing that level okay? Uh, so one note is fine, but if I play two notes, like something that sounds like this, sounds nice like this, but if I play it through the octave, you hear how it doesn't understand what I'm doing and it's like, blah, 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 like flipping between notes. So that's what a monophonic pedal will do. A polyphonic pedal, which is what digital octaves are, will uh, understand it fine if you play a chord. It'll reproduce all those notes. So blah, 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 blah. So to do this trick, you need a monophonic analog octave pedal. Uh, I see someone saying louder. Uh, uh, anybody else think the bass needs to be louder? The bass always needs to be louder. Okay, so there's a really cool way you can use the monophonic issue to actually improve your playing, and I'm gonna tell you what that is instead of just saying it over and over again. So the thing is that not only will it get confused if you play two notes at once on purpose, or three or four notes, but if you're playing a note and you're not muting the other strings well, that will also confuse the octave pedal, and it'll be getting all these inputs, and it'll be like, I can only process one input, beep, bloop, 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 bass bot style. Um, and so it'll make garbly noises. And what that means is that to play through an analog octave pedal and sound good, you have to have really good muting technique. And what this results in is I see reviews online of people like, this pedal sucks, it didn't understand the notes I was playing. I was like, okay, you have bad muting technique is, is what's going on there. <laughs> um, so, and it can sometimes be hard to tell how tight your muting actually is. Like obviously you can tell if like a big, you're playing notes. And there's like a big open E ringing underneath it. But if something more subtle is happening, you might not be catching it. And the analog octave will make all of that stuff obvious to you. So for example, let me try, I'm just gonna play like a B flat major scale up here. And if I play that with my normal muting technique, you can hear all the notes come out nice and clean. You know, no tracking issues, even though people complain about analog octave tracking. But if I play with no muting considerations at all, let's see if we can get some glitching happening. Uh, okay, that didn't sound that glitchy. Uh, let me see if I can find a better example. Uh, well, I'll just simulate it a little bit. Uh, so I'll get the E ringing. Sometimes it's hard. I need Noob Josh here to perfectly simulate the mistakes right when I need them simulated, you know? Um, uh, but you can hear, if I have another string ringing and I try to play a scale, it sounds like a garbled mess. So what that indicates to me is that I need to fix something with the muting, which is really good for practice purposes. And eventually, when you're good at this, you can do it in a performance setting and it's not a big deal. Um, so this is more of a diagnostic tool than a specific exercise. For specific exercises, you can check out my... Um, uh, my muting video, which I think is called Your Muting Technique, sounds like uh, which is just one of my classic bass buzzy titles. Uh, and you can work on your muting rudiments, which I'll talk through really quickly. The most important thing is that the thumb of your plucking hand is going to keep the lower strings from ringing when you don't want them ringing, which with this B-flat major scale I was just playing is the thing that would be most likely to have issues. Um, because if I don't have that thumb there, then the E's gonna ring and it's gonna sound like badness that I won't keep making you listen to. The other thing you're really gonna have to watch is your fretting hand muting. Um, and you can also worry about the sneaky finger stuff, which we're gonna talk about in the muting video. But if you only had two muting tools, number one would be the thumb of your plucking hand, which covers the lower strings below your plucking fingers. And tool number two would be your fretting hand, which 
can more easily cover the higher strings above the ones you're plucking. So if I'm plucking the A string, then I can mute the E nicely with my thumb, and I can mute the D and G nicely with my fretting hand just by having it flat enough so that you're getting contact on the strings you don't want to play. Um, and you can also use the fretting hand for muting lower strings. So like if I'm playing on the G string, I can mute these strings just by laying the index finger across. That gets into more intermediate advanced muting territory. Um, the best thing as a beginner is just to get really clean on that thumb. And that's how you can use octave pedals to clean up your playing instead of leaving reviews on Sweetwater that the octave pedal didn't have good tracking because it was probably your technique. Okay. Thank you all for your comments. I see hello from the UK past 2 a.m. I said this would be at an ungodly hour in Europe and you're here anyway. I really appreciate that. <laughs> this person is in school. What's up, criminal arcana? You are a criminal because I don't think you're supposed to watch base live streams in school. I don't know what they do in school these days. It's been a while since I dropped out of college. Um, okay. Hopefully that's all making sense. Let me know if not in the comments, but I'm going to move on to the second type of pedal that I think can really help your playing, which is a delay pedal. So this is the TC Electronic Flashback 2 delay. Okay, real quick, sorry, back to the octave pedal, because I'm flashing my um, I'm flashing my Boss OC2 here, and you're probably getting some gas because these are no longer in production, and they're really expensive on reverb now. I was just looking, they're like 200 bucks or something. I got this for like $60. And it's a very similar sound, that cool synthy sound. Um, it's a really similar sound that you get on the OC3 and the OC5, which are both currently in production and easier to find. So yes, this is a cool pedal. I like it. Um, but you don't like have to get this specific one. And um, uh, uh, is this going to make me sound like some lo-fi music, says a person. Uh, this is a great way to sound lo-fi. You just program a beat with slightly non-quantized hi-hats and then play some uh, play some lumpy eighth notes. I think that would be a great way to do it. And Billy G. Murphy is asking which one is used on the Peter Gabriel albums, Polly or the other. That is a great question that I don't know the answer to because uh, I haven't listened to that much Peter Gabriel, which is wrong of me because he's a great songwriter and Tony Levin played a bunch of amazing bass on that stuff. Uh, and I just haven't spent that much time with it. So, um, it'd be hard to say if we're talking about older stuff from the eighties and it was probably analog. Cause I don't know how much digital octave options there were for bass back then. Um, but yeah, I totally don't know. Okay. Uh, and I see, <laughs> see people talking about P bases a lot. Maybe I will grab, a P bass later. I'd have to put you on a little break to get it all hooked up, but I do like me some P bass. Okay, let's talk about delay. So this is the TC Electronic Flashback 2 delay, but what I'm about to talk to you about is going to work with any delay pedal, like digital, analog, it really doesn't matter. Um, I have this set to just do a basic digital delay, like, oh, come on. Yeah. Let's see, let's turn the octave off. So, so you can hear if I just play a chord and then it repeats sometimes. So a delay pedal takes what you play and then it repeats it a number of times. And that's what a delay does. So delay pedals are a really cool way to work on your rhythm. That's different than just practicing with a metronome. Um, and I like it because it's a little more creative and you can play around with it more interactively. So there's a bunch of ways to do this. I actually talked about this in a video on my Josh Foscreen YouTube channel, which is more advanced stuff and also just older videos than bass buzz. Um, but the simplest way to do this, if you have a delay pedal and you can do this with anything, you do it with a delay in GarageBand or Logic, whatever, is to just play something and see where the delay speed is. And that's going to be your quarter note. So you can hear I go, but so this is where my quarter note is. So what I can do is now use this as a metronome and just try to play along with that pulse. And I'll know if I'm rushing or dragging, um, based on if I end up in the whiplash movie. No, I'll know if I'm rushing or dragging if it starts to sound messy. So here's if I keep playing quarter note at the same tempo. So here I'm it sounds like nothing's really happening because I'm consistently playing at the same speed. So by the time the next delay happens, I'm playing the next note and then the delay is here. And then I, so that makes sense. But if I drift, 
of Rush. You can hear now there's like ping-ponging around the delays, and that lets me know that I wasn't staying on that quarter note pulse. Same thing if I drag, so here's the quarter note. It goes but um but um but um like you're falling down the stairs. So um, in a way, it's actually better than practicing with the metronome because you get immediate feedback on how you did, whereas with the metronome, if you're not paying attention, uh, you might just kind of keep rushing and dragging and not uh, not really catch it. But the delay will give you a little more like a musical style input that you need to uh, that you need to clean up your rhythm. OK. And there's really fun ways to play with that that are more advanced, too. Like I won't explain in detail, but. different rhythms in a quarter note like way cooler stuff to happen. So just real quick what I'm doing there if you're more advanced is I'm finding where the chord note is and then I'm playing a dotted eighth note against that. Um, no, sorry, I'm putting the, <laughs> I haven't talked about this in a while, I'm putting a delay on a dotted eighth note against where I'm putting the quarter note and then so that gets stuff to stack up in a cool way. But if you're a beginner, the best thing to do is just think quarter notes. One, two, three. And if you want it to sound cooler than just playing a single note, you can try playing some arpeggio stuff. So if, if you know how to play a major triad arpeggio, add the octave, or you do minor. Yeah, so I really like that about delay pedals. You can really learn a lot from it besides that it just sounds like you're in space and it's really cool. Um, okay, and just real quick, um, there are a lot of different kinds of delays. What I'm doing here is just a basic digital delay, and that's probably the best for this because it's going to be nice, clean repeats that won't get too colored or disappear too quickly. Um, and one more pro tip on that, if you play short notes, you'll get better data. So I'm playing like short, 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 short. And that gives me plenty of blank space to hear if I'm being precise or not, because if I play long notes and then I drag, it's a little less obvious because there's like a wash of sound that's continuing to happen. Um, so whether you're doing the simple chord note thing, you can hear I'm going like play, cut, play, cut so that there's some space, or if you're doing a more... more complex thing if I play long notes there. Again, it just doesn't pop out as much, so it's not as good of a rhythm training tool. Okay, that's the magic with delay pedals. All right, let me look at your comments here because I am missing so many questions. Uh, yes, staccato, that is what I'm talking about. Height reveal, that's a great question. All right, ready? That tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> okay. All right, I want to get to some questions. Let's get through this third pedal that I think is really useful to own. It can really help with your practice um, and also isn't super boutique and expensive. So again, I have a TC Electronic pedal here. Uh, they're not paying me to make this. I just own some of their pedals. So this is just a really simple looper pedal, and you can do this with any looper. There are a lot of really useful things you can do with loopers, um, and I'm only going to talk about one of them because otherwise this could take a really, really long time. But the best thing that I think um, you can use a looper for is learning to improvise using the scales that you learn. So this is something I have my students do in the Beginner to Badass course. It's something I make basically every private student I've ever had do, is once you know how to play a scale, that's great, but now you need to learn how to make music with it. And the best way to do that is to just try stuff. Um, the problem is, let's say I teach you this E major scale, and 
you're like, okay, great, I can play it. I know the shape. Maybe I even know a couple shapes. Did I just miss a note on an E major scale? Live streaming will do crazy things to a person. Um, but that's not quite music, right? And I talked about this in my scales video featuring bass bot years ago. Um, so you wiggle around, you try some different stuff. Uh, the problem with that is that's not really how we play music, right? Unless you're doing an actual solo piece, it's usually in context. The choices you make are influenced by what's happening in the guitar, what's happening in the keyboard and stuff. So the best way to improvise with scales is to have some kind of drone telling you where the root note is. And then you can hear how all of your decisions sound in relationship to a root note, which is always going to be being heard by the listener. Okay, So that's where the looper comes in because you can actually create that for yourself. So let's say, let's say I wanna practice a G major scale and I'm gonna do this up high so that I can do it more melodic style and have a bass line underneath. So I've got my G up here on the A string. I play my little G major scale, which if you don't know, you can learn it in my scales video or in my beginner to badass course. Um, but if I just play notes from that scale, it's not gonna give me the feedback of how do all these notes relate to the root note. And that's where, if I just do something really simple on the looper, this does not require any finesse, but I'm just going to like play a G. And now that's just playing and I don't have to worry about it. And now I can try stuff from the G major scale. And when I play a note, I can hear how it relates vertically to the root note because the root's down here. And then I go up and I play the seventh, the F sharp. And I can hear how that actually feels in context, whereas if that's not happening, it doesn't tell me a whole lot. But if this is going, there's the sixth, there's the fifth, Hmm, the fifth, the tension of the fourth, the color, the colorful loveliness of the third, the kind of like open whateverness of the second, I don't know what words to use for that, and the resolution on the root. So all of a sudden, all of that data is actually available to you in your practice versus just noodling around on the scale, hoping that you'll find some music with it. So. You might have noticed that didn't require any particular looping skills. I mean, you see people doing incredible stuff with live looping, uh, and that is not what I just did. I did not do the impressive thing. Um, but that's just a really simple thing you can do. And you can also make it a little more interesting so I can do some overdubs. So now I'm in overdub mode on this looper. I could just like play a bunch of Gs. So that's not super interesting, but I could do other cool stuff too. I could do little volume swells on a G. I could combine, put some octave pedal on that. And you can make nicely textured little loops for yourself to play over that are maybe more creatively inspiring. But at the rudiment of all this, it's just, uh, it's just laying down the octave. Okay, so you know what that means it's time for. It is time for, oh, I thought I had a cool chapter screen for this. Okay, uh, I'm gonna play you the wrong chapter screen because I made you these cool little chapter screens. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you some music that I like that uses pedals and then I'm gonna get to your questions. Here we go. Thank you for forgiving all of my tech foolishness. Okay, so uh, bass pedals are cool and they are actually used in music sometimes, not just used to drain bank accounts. And you notice I'm not showing you all my cool expensive boutique pedals today. Uh, it's partly because getting the setup together would have been very complicated, but it's also because I don't want to give you a bunch of gas um, because it's just, it's dangerous with the pedals. You know, you get a bass, you get an amp, you're like, okay, I'm set, but pedals is just infinity. Gas guy is a, is a beast. Okay, so the first thing I wanna show you is a live clip from Mark Juliana's band playing some music off of his beat music record. And you can hear this 
analog octave sound being soloed by the bass player Chris Morrissey. So let's check this out together. Let me kill the picture in picture. Let's check it out. All right, listen to this bass sound. Ducking down for the pedals. Okay, so this is the synth. That's the bass player third from the right. And here the bass comes. Okay, this is actually blended clean sound and low octave sound. So you can hear there's two octaves on the bass line. And you see he's playing high up on the neck because he has that low octave coming from the pedal underneath. You really don't know how it's going to feel until it happens to you. Okay, and then the silly vocal samples start. Any of you guys Mark Juliana fans? I love that beat music record. I've listened to it like so infinity many times. Um, and yeah, Chris Morrissey is a really cool bass player. So that was a blended sound where you could hear, so I can actually uh, show you. So the way I would get that is to turn the clean signal up. So now we have this. Uh, let's see what key was that in. Uh, something like that. I have to actually learn that riff. So that's a blended sound. But what I'm going to play for you on the next clip is this, which, which is none of the clean sound of your bass on all octave sound, which gives you that super synthy sound. So let's check this out. I think this is the right clip. Yeah. You wouldn't even know it was a bass if you didn't know what to look for or listen for. And you can hear there's some bend in the notes. He's just doing that by bending the string with his fingers. Makes it sound like a mod wheel on a synth. If anyone knows this record, put it in the comments for other people to find. Mark Juliana, beat music, beat music, beat music. Okay, I can't reach the keyboard. Okay, so uh, those are both Mark Julian examples. Last one I want to show you is some hiatus coyote. You've seen me wearing their t-shirt in some videos. This is Paul Bender on the bass using some fuzz. I believe it's the Zvex Fuzz Factory. And you'll really hear how it makes bass harmonics pop out. We didn't talk about drive today, but um, distortion and fuzz and stuff can be really cool on bass too. So here's a little bit of Swamp Thing by hiatus coyote. I'm in love with this album. This is off Choose Your Weapon. Okay, I've been listening to that record for years and I'm just never tired of it. So that's Hiatus Coyote Swamp Thing. Somebody could post how to spell Hiatus Coyote in the chat for other people, that would be great. Um, okay, and that means it is now time for... That's right, let's do Q&A. Thanks for sticking around, I appreciate it. Please make sure to subscribe if this is your first Bass Buzz experience. Because normally, it's nicely edited and there's less umming and me clapping my hands together. It's like even better than this, uh, but less Christmas sweaters. So let's hit some questions. I flagged some stuff already, but this is the part where you're just gonna completely blow my mind with how many questions there are and I'm gonna miss some stuff. And I'm really sorry. Okay, this is good. Let's do this. Okay, uh, Amendment W, that is probably not your real name. Digging the Beginner to Badass course now and loving it. Thank you. I just bought a used MXR Distortion. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Um, distortion is good for sounding distorted. 
<laughs> is there a good answer to that question? Yeah, I mean, some distortion pedals are better than others. Uh, I've played a couple MXR, like bass distortion, bass overdrive. I think they're good. I think MXR makes a lot of great pedals. Um, and I mean, basically, if you want your bass to sound dirty like that, the main thing to watch out for is just if you still have good low end and if you're still cutting through the mix, uh, that can require some tweaking with the tone and bumping your level maybe a little more than you think you need with the distortion. So that's what I got for you right now. Return of the gas guy. Yes, absolutely. Um, hey, Christine. Hi, Josh. No matter what I try, I can't seem to get into collecting lots of gear. What am I doing wrong? Um, you're not watching enough uh, unboxing videos and review videos. Um, and you're probably spending too much time practicing. So I think those are some problems you could solve. Uh, okay, old Uncle Mix has got to buy a battery for my OC2. Just for the record, there is no battery in this. Um, I always run everything off of wall power because I don't like the idea that there are all these batteries that could die at any point. Sometimes guitar players like to run distortion off of battery because as the battery dies, it changes the sound of the pedal. Bloody, bloody, bloody nerd stuff. But in terms of like an OC2 or pretty much any bass pedal, um, running off of wall power is the best thing. Or like a dedicated pedal board power supply unit like the Chox um, DC and AC units, which is what I'm into. Or you can just use a cheap one spot, which is what I'm running these off of right now. 315 HFD. Did your mother give you that name? I had a distortion pedal from my guitar days and it sounds horrible on bass. Uh, yeah, that is the thing. Let me, uh, let me play you some nice delay chords while I drink some water. Okay. So some distortion pedals sound bad on bass. Again, I'm not a super techie pedal expert, so I can't tell you the technical bits of why that is. But musically, a lot of distortion pedals will just kill all your low end and make you sound really like thin and guitar-y, which for most things is not so good because you need that solid bass underneath. Axel R. Hey, what's up? I remember that name from the last stream. Hey, Josh, if you get a chance, can you do a quick blurb on picks? What is the best thickness? Okay, so I'm not a pick expert. I'm adequate with a pick. Um, but for me, my thickness range is between these two, the Tortex, uh, this is 0.6 millimeters, and this is one millimeter. That's about my range. In the one millimeter camp, uh, I'm pretty sure Tim Lefebvre uses one millimeter, and that's why I started trying it, because I just copy everything I see him do. Um, all the delay on that's fun and the thinner picks um if you watch nolly from periphery he actually uses thin picks for the metal stuff because they're more clicky i think i talked about this in my picks video but i don't think there's a right answer i think some of it is the sound the thicker picks are a little darker but some of it is just preference too um, and i saw somebody mentioned that you're that you get kind of stuck on the strings with a thick pick and like yeah that's totally thing and you have to figure out how to work around it with your the intensity of your attack and the angle of attack. Um, and just get comfortable picking on your bass. It's just a repetition thing. Okay, Albert Monterio, what else does the freeze pedal thing? So Albert's talking about the, um, the oh, who makes that? Is that EHX? That's EHX, right? The freeze pedal is really cool and you can use it in a similar way to how I was talking about the looper, except it's not really a loop. It'll hear a note you put into it and then kind of sustain that note into a drone um, in a way, it's actually better than a looper for what I was talking about earlier with creating uh, root note pads for yourself, but it's just more limited. Whereas if you're just going to own a few pedals and you get yourself a looper, you can do the drone thing and do a bunch of other stuff. But I think the freeze pedal is really cool. And I actually don't know of another pedal that does that exact thing. Maybe somebody else can let us know in the comments if you're hip to a pedal I don't know about. Corey Newman. Hey, Josh, just wondering thoughts on multi effects units like the Boss ME50B thinking of buying one. Okay, so I'll go quick on this because I could talk about this for a long time. So on one hand of the spectrum, you got your multi effects units, which can do a ton of things. And actually, that's the first thing I ever had. It's in the closet right now. But I have an old boss ME 50 B. And that was like my only effects pedals for a long time. And then on the other side, you have uh, pedals that only do one thing. Obviously, you can spend more money on pedals that only do one thing, maybe. 
Um, for me, I could talk about this for such a long time. For me, it comes down to preference. And my preference is to play with simple pedals where I really understand what's happening when I twiddle all the knobs. And the more a pedal feels like a black box or a computer, I just notice myself feeling less inspired and less likely to play with that pedal. Case in point, I have an Eventide H9 sitting over here somewhere that I like never use, even though it sounds amazing and has tons of cool stuff in it. But it just feels like doing computer work and I like to not be doing computer work when I'm playing music. So um, I don't go for the multi effects so much. That said, people do amazing stuff with them. There's some convenience factors with presets and stuff, um, but it just really depends on what are you aiming for? What are your goals? What feels like the most fun to you? Do you actually need it for a gig or is it just for fun? That's where I would kind of point you for starters. Uh, gaming 001, is the shiny fretboard better? Um, it's shinier. <laughs> Pineapple squared, what pedal should I use for repetitions? I think you want a delay pedal is what it sounds like you're saying, what it sounds like you're saying, what it sounds, okay, I put a delay on myself. Okay, why would anyone ever do drugs or drink when we could just play bass? Good question. <laughs> Danny, is it better to play that flashback pedal through the front of the amp or through the amp's effects loop? This is a good question. So for pretty much all bass effecting, I don't think you ever need to use the effects loop on an amp. Um, you can, but it's just a lot simpler these days, especially the way things are tending to get like mic'd and put in the house um, in music venues compared to back when they were using effects loops more exclusively. I just run everything in the front and then run it into the amp. Um, especially because on some gigs, I run everything into the Noble DI here and the sound person will take the out from that and then I'll run into the amp as a monitor. So if I was running an effects loop on the amp, then none of, nothing would go into the house. So that would be no good. So I'm not an effects loop guy. I don't actually know a reason to use them. Editor Bigger, sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Do you play instruments other than bass? Technically, yes, not particularly well, but if you take the beginner to badass course, you can hear some of my guitar playing on the play along tracks. Not on all of it, but on some of it. Um, yeah, I love guitar. I'm not great at it at like performance level, but it's nice to be able to play some guitar just as a human to be able to like sing some songs with people, entertain yourself. Uh, Eric Flores, opinion on Digitech Whammy. I love the Digitech bass whammy. It is monstrous. It's like the one of the biggest footprint pedals I own. Um, I think it's really cool. I think it has some limitations, like that you can't adjust the mix between the clean signal and the affected signal. I've had issues with that, trying to use it in a live sound environment. Um, and there's also the, um, shoot, what's it called? There's like a mini version of the Whammy. It's like sitting back there and I can't think of the name of it. That's like a normal stomp box size. Maybe somebody knows what I'm talking about. And it just has a normal, foot switch like you would see on, on one of these pedals. Um, and you can put it in momentary mode and do all the whammy stuff, but it's like a much smaller box. It doesn't give you the option to control the rate of the whammy, but it's a lot more compact and I actually like it a lot. Okay, thank you guys for all your questions. Thank you Gleber for your super chat. Merry Christmas to the best bass teacher. Is there a specific order to connect the pedals or it doesn't matter? Um, yeah, pedal order is an interesting thing we could talk about for a long time. Should we talk about pedal order for an hour? No, probably not. But, um, so the thing about pedal order is that every pedal you turn on is going to then change what the next pedal hears. So you can be strategic about that. And there's kind of a normal way of doing it, which you can find this, there are probably a lot of guitar videos about this, but normally you start with like pitch stuff like octaves, then you would go to your drives. Then you would go to your modulations like chorus and flanger. Then you would go to your time effects like delay and reverb. And you know, synth pedals would be at the beginning, blah, 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 blah. So there's kind of a way of doing it, but it also really depends on what you want to create. Like with the, with a loop pedal, there's a lot of considerations because um, I could do really cool stuff with this either place. If I put it here, then obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious. So I'll play some octave stuff. So that sound is going to go, let me turn up the loop a little bit. 
That octave sound is now baked into the looper, so if I turn this pedal off, it doesn't change what's on the loop because it's already been like cooked in. Um, and if I if I play now, it's unaffected, but the loop has the effect on it. So having a looper at the end of the chain is a nice way to like bake stuff in, and then you can change what you play after. So now I could like put a little delay on. Um, so that's nice. If the looper was at the beginning of the chain, then I could play stuff and then affect what was on the loop uh, without changing the input signal. So there's just cool decisions to make there. Okay, so many questions. What kind of pedal gives you that wet underwater sound? That's a good question. So this, this is the most fun thing about pedals is using f descriptive phrases like this. Like, it doesn't come up so much when you just have like a bass and an amp and you're like, I want it to sound like I'm underwater. Like, what do I do? Like, there's, I don't actually know because there's a lot of ways you could get it to sound underwater. I mean, even just the OC2, I think sounds kind of underwatery. Maybe if I put a little chorus on it, which I don't have set up right now. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways to sound underwatery. I, maybe chorus is what you're thinking of though. Okay, what's up, Adam? Thanks for the super chat. I'm on Beginner to Badass Module 8. What's cool in the second half? Well, thank you for this opportunity to talk about what's great about the Beginner to Badass course. So, um, I mean, gosh, you've got a lot of cool stuff coming in the second half. I do a lot of just building technique and theory fundamentals in the first half, but by the second half, we're talking about scales, we're talking about working in different keys, we start talking about chord progressions and diatonic chord progressions, how all that stuff works start talking about how to build bass lines, learn a bunch of cool riffs. Um, so yeah, I really like the second half of the course. And we finish up by learning how to jam with other people. It's gonna be really fun. Okay, is compression good or fun outside of recording? Thanks for the question, Bob. So compression is scary to talk about because uh, like some effects are just obvious. You know, if I kick on this octave, you can hear that something's going on, right? Like it's lower than it should be and it sounds synthy. It's really obvious. But if your ear is not trained to hear compression, it's really easy to just be like, I don't know what's happening. And to be honest, I still have moments where I feel that way. Um, you know, there are sound engineers who can hear minute amounts of subtle compression and they can hear the effect that has in music. That's not me. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, so it really depends. I think for me, for live playing, it's not super necessary, but it depends. If I'm slapping or tapping, it's nicer. And you hear people who play that kind of stuff live care more about live compression. Like Billy Sheehan has a lot of strong inputs and opinions about live compression. Um, and I would listen to all the things he says because he's brilliant. Um, for me, it's fine. Like if I'm playing an amp that has built-in compression like this dark class does, then, you know, I'm cool if it goes in the house or I'm cool if it doesn't, if I just take the house from the noble and then the compression is just on the amp, like it doesn't matter that much. But if I'm doing, if I'm doing slappy stuff, then I might care about it more. So that's a little bit about compression. Um, just real quick, if you don't know what compression is, uh, watch a video with Robert Keeley where he explains it better than I possibly could right now. Darren Land, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate that. It's very kind. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I hope I'm sharing some knowledge. Definitely talking a lot. Um, all right, hit me with some more questions, gang. Thought my DI was glitching again. I should just sell audiovisual equipment and make you think that your stuff is broken when my audio glitches out. I think that would be a good move. Um, it may have been cat related, but it would have had to been a tele telekinetic cat because I don't actually have any cats here. I would like to have a cat someday. I had cats when I was growing up. NC, hey Josh, I'm taking beginner to badass. How do we figure out during chord progressions common notes between the chords? That's a great question. So um, this is going to be a stupidly simple answer, but just write down what the chords are. Write down the notes in those chords. <laughs> and use a cheat sheet if you need to, and then just look at common tones. So let's say I'm not gonna get a, I should have a whiteboard. Should I have a whiteboard for these? That'd be fun. So let's say we're going from 
C major to G major. So, okay, C major chord, what are the notes in the C major chord? I know it's going to be root, third, fifth from a C major scale, so that'd be one, two, three, four, five, C, E, G. Okay, so that's C, E, G. Now I'm going to look at a G major chord. That would be one, three, five from a G major scale. So that'd be G, B, D. So then I look, okay, I have C, E, G, G, B, D. G is a common tone. B and D are not. So that's the starting point. The other thing is to look at if I'm going from C to G or from G back to C, if I'm on a non-common tone, what chord tone could it resolve to on the next chord? So uh, if I'm on the G major chord and I'm on a B, and now I'm going to go to the C chord, which is C, E, G, I'm going to think what note of the C chord, C, E, G, is closest to the B that I'm on, and that would be C. So then I can do a nice resolution in my little melodic phrase or bass line or whatever. So that's that. Um, Thoughts on Mark Sandman from Morphine playing the bass with slide. Yeah, playing bass with a slide. It's pretty weird. Not a lot of people do it. Uh, it's hard to make it sound good. I think you'd really have to dial your bass with higher action so that you can, you know, people who play slide a lot have it have their setup dialed. I haven't successfully made any good sounds with a slide on bass. I have tried. Okay, questions, questions, questions. Jeremy Ellis, thoughts on Aguilar Tone Hammer? Honestly, are you, are you ready for me to be honest? Hold on. This requires water. I know that a lot of really great bass players use the Aguilar heads. I don't like how they sound, and I just can't manage to like them. And so I don't know. I think they make they seem to make good gear. There seem to be really good players who like their stuff. But for me, every time I've plugged a bass into a tone hammer head, it just feels like there's EQ spikes and cuts in like all the wrong places for what I want. Like brittle high mids and not satisfying enough low end. And I, maybe I just need to spend more time with them. But that's where I've landed on the tone hammer stuff so far. Okay, and if you're asking the same question over and over. I understand that I'm missing questions and I'm sorry, but just try to like be cool about it, you know, like don't spam it too hard. Um, Louisiana Elevators, what is your opinion on the Boss DS1? Uh, it's more of a guitar pedal as far as I know, but I could be so wrong and now I'm going to get so many comments about what an idiot I am. But um, I'm not super familiar. And there's like such an infinity of drive pedals and I've played a fraction of them. What is the distortion pedal you used in your cliff video? That is a great question, Will. Uh, what did I use? I used the um, I used the Dunlop Crybaby Wah. I might have used the Chase Bliss Brothers dual drive pedal, but I might have used something else. Honestly, <laughs> I don't remember. Okay, I'm back on the DS1. Somebody's saying it cuts off the low end. That would track with me saying it's more of a guitar pedal which may or may not be true. Um, Purple Chili, what pedal should I use and what configuration to kind of sound like post-punky? I'm also on Module 9 of Beginner to Badass. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I should only highlight questions I actually have satisfying answers to. But I guess it would mean, I would ask, like, what do you mean by post-punk specifically? And then I would just look at what do people in those bands use? And this is... This is me saving face that I don't really know the answer in the post-punk situation. But anytime you're like, how do I play this style? How do I, how do people set things up in the style? Like just copy what people are already doing is a really good starting point. And we have some stigma about copying things in our culture. Indeed, on this very platform of YouTube, we have stigma about copying things with the way copyright law is enforced or not enforced. Uh, insert Rick Beato 20 minute rant. Um, but it's really good to just copy stuff, you know, if you're wondering, like, how do I, how do I sound kind of like this band, like, just copy a bunch of things and then see what sticks. It's a really good place to go. Uh, another Josh, what's up, another Josh? Do you ever go to a gig with no pedals? Yes, absolutely. And this cannot be emphasized enough. I would say almost every gig I've ever done, <laughs> I've showed up with no pedals. Uh, and if you watch most gigs, most bands, most bass players, most live concerts, uh, the bass player doesn't have any pedals because it's just really not what we mostly need to do. We mostly need to make this sound, the sound of the bass. Um, 
And gigs where you need to make other sounds or significantly adjust the sound, they're a lot more rare in my experience. Again, it depends on genre. If you're playing in like a electronic music live band situation, obviously you're going to need a bunch of synth pedals and stuff. But for just normal bass playing, like, yeah. I just did a couple gigs with the Fleetwood Mac cover band that I really enjoyed. And it was literally P bass, cable, amp, done. So I like show up and, you know, I'm tearing down at the end of the night and everybody else is coiling cables and packing up pedals and stuff. And I'm just like, I don't have anything to do. I wish I had some toys. That's what pedals feel like to me is it's like I get to bring my toys everywhere. It's like if you could just show up to a gig and like build something with your Legos and like, look what I made. Like, that's kind of how pedals feel to me. Okay. Uh, some guy named Ethan, are the pedals made for basses really different from pedals made for, for guitars? It super depends on the type of effect and probably some other factors. Um, like, okay, I'll just give you one example. MXR makes the analog chorus pedal, which I love. They also make the bass chorus deluxe. So you would think, oh, the bass chorus deluxe must be better for bass. I actually prefer the analog chorus, which is not specified what instrument it's for. Um, because given the right controls and everything, a chorus pedal is just a chorus pedal. It kind of works on everything. Versus, like I was saying earlier with distortion pedals, some distortion pedals really cut a lot of low end, which on guitar doesn't matter, but on bass extremely matters. So yeah, it depends. But like delays, reverbs, that kind of stuff, not so important. Brandon, in the newest bassbus video, you mentioned seventh chords. Is that something we covered in Beginner to Badass? Uh, I do not cover seventh chords in Beginner to Badass, which if you haven't taken the course, you might find this a contentious point because it's considered to be a basic thing that everybody should know. Um, but my goal with Beginner to Badass was to just hit the fundamentals so hard that by the end of it, you just know the crap out of all of them. And so in order to do that, I pushed some stuff to later, which I hope someday will be a follow-up to Beginner to Badass. I saw someone asked about that earlier. It doesn't currently exist. And I really want it to, and that's really all I can tell you about it at this point. Can you play the five string? I think that answers that question. Do you like Dream Theater music? What's up, Gabriel Walker? Can you play some, please? All right, let's see if I remember my one Dream Theater lick. You ready? I wish I had some drive. <laughs> That's all I got. That was, was that right? I think that was the main riff from Yitzy Jam. It's been a while. Okay, I'm getting some Sansamp questions. Claudia is asking about the Getty Lee pedal and Darth Invictus. That's a good username. You ever tried the Steve Harris Sansamp pedals? I have not. I think the basic Sansamp pedal is super cool and I'm interested in those pedals. Uh, maybe next time I do a Steve Harris or Getty Lee video, I should like get them and see if it uh, I mean, the goal with those pedals, obviously, is that you'll just magically sound like that person with no effort required. So that's what I would hope for if I bought one of those pedals. Okay. Fraggle Rock. Are Ampeg SVTs really all that? That's an interesting question. I'm really not an expert on this, just to be clear, because as you can tell from my age, I was not even alive in the era of like the SVT and the studio work where that was like the sound. So my take as a foolish young person who hopefully has helpful things to say for you sometimes is um, there are certain things that are musically important to us now because we've heard them so much, like the Fender P bass and the Fender J bass and an Ampeg B15 and an Ampeg SVT. Like these are just sounds that are baked into our consciousness at this point because all the music we love uh, was made using them. So I think... You know, the Fender basses, the Ampegs and stuff, there may be some objective-ish reasons why they're the thing, but I think there's also a lot to be said for just the nostalgia factor and the familiarity factor. So I think SVTs are cool. I think Ampegs play, pair really nicely with Fender basses because they feel to me, and I could actually be wrong about this, but for whatever reason, they feel to me like they do kind of a scoopy thing. So you get big lows and big highs and a little bit of mid scoop. And that just works nicely with how P and J basses sound. But um, I don't know. Obviously, I'm not like carting a big. The other thing about Ampeg amps is they're still really big and heavy, which is really cool for studios. It's not so cool when you have to actually haul your own gear. So that's why I like the dark glass head these days, because it's like five pounds or something. Uh, and that is worth a lot to me. 
Okay, uh, do I have videos references for where you can learn about seventh chords? Yes, uh, look on the Josh Foscreen YouTube channel. I have a series of four videos where I talk about how to actually play seventh chord voicings on bass. Uh, and there's some like play alongs and stuff. So I think not all my old videos I'm still in love with, but those ones are pretty good. Gufkos, upgrade components on a beginner bass versus purchasing a, purchasing a higher end bass. I mean, if you like to tinker, you should probably do the upgrade thing because it'll give you more to tinker with. I personally have tinkered very little. This bass has the um, this bass has the Audier preamp that I threw in there because I didn't like the passive electronics. Um, I s replaced the electronics, uh, I replaced the pickups and electronics on my Red Jazz bass because they were old and they were going microphonic. But I, I'm not a big tinkerer, so I kind of like to just buy a bass that is the way I like. Um, and you probably save money just buying a bass that's already the way you like versus tinkering. Um, and you also possibly will get better resale value because Franken bases, for me, when I see a Franken base on Craigslist or whatever, I'm just kind of like, I'm good. <laughs> no, thanks. Okay. But yeah, like Plugman says, it's a good way to learn soldering and luthier work. So if you're into that, I think it's a great idea. I would probably benefit from doing more of that because I'm still kind of a noob when it comes to a lot of the setup and luthier stuff. What's up, Olivia? Greetings to Italy. Oh, I, I can't believe I just did a bad Italian accent live on YouTube. I just love it. Okay. Uh, how do I sound like Tim Comerford? Um, you don't. <laughs> this is a sequel to my answer to the how do you sound like John Entwistle question on the last live stream. Um, I mean, starting point would be drop your E string to D and then play a bunch of really cool riffs. Thank you to the super chat. Sorry if I'm missing stuff. Thank you, Hollis. What pedal helps you sound better with just a normal bass tone? Just a compressor. That's a cool question. Uh, it can, it can help thicken you up a little bit, but ideally your bass is already sounding good. Like if the bass into the amp isn't sounding good, I would look at maybe addressing a problem rather than adding a pedal. Um, it may be that you don't actually like the sound of your amp, that could be a thing, maybe test it against a headphone amp. Um, yeah, that's a tricky question. It really depends on style too. Yeah. Okay, Zero Result, what guitar is that? This is the Squire Vintage Modified 2016. They're no longer in production and people gas for them weirdly and I don't really know why. I hope I'm not contributing by using it in videos. It's just a decent Squire. It's similar to the Classic Vibe series. Um, but don't pay a ton of money for them on reverb like they're going for now. Okay, a couple more questions and then we got to wrap it up, gang. Addison, is a short scale bass bad to learn on? No, it's great. Uh, I did a whole video about um, are your hands too small to play bass, talking about small hand stuff, and I talk about short scales. I think if it feels good to you, they're great, they're super legit, it's not like a fake toy bass, and there's a lot of cool things you can do with a short scale. Okay, can you play something with that octave pedal? I sure can. Anybody who wasn't here earlier, let's make some sound and wrap this business up. Thank you guys so much for coming to the stream. I thought I turned off the loop and I didn't. That's the other fun thing about pedals is learning how to tap dance and actually do the thing you meant to do. Really appreciate you guys all showing up. I could just stay and answer questions all night, but, um, but we'll save some for next time. So thank you for coming. I'll be back at you with another live stream next month. Got more videos coming your way. I'm really excited about a lot of the stuff I have planned for the new year. Happy holidays. Thank you for coming. I'm going to look at your comments real quick. 
say goodbye to me if you want to. The Sirius is coming back, maybe. Sirius is not a good teaching base because it has no fret markers. What is a good second base? Uh, okay, we'll talk about that next time. Thanks, everybody. Heading out. See you next time. Happy holidays.